Hey everyone, Nate Gottlieb here. Welcome to another season of Nate on the Farm. I'm so excited to be with you as we tour farms around Minnesota and learn more about corn farming. Today, I'll be touring the family farm of Dwayne Eplin in Freeborn County, Minnesota. Dwayne grows corn and soybeans with his brother Bruce on land that's been in their family for over 60 years. His dad, Jerry, is still an active presence in his farm operation, as is his wife, Jean, and sister-in-law, Lisa. Dwayne is also the vice chair of the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council, a farmer-led group that invests funds in efforts to increase the sustainability and productivity of corn farming. So come along with me as we learn more and tour Duane's farm. Hey Duane. Hello Nate. Good, Good morning. To see you. Yeah, Good morning. thanks for having me out today. Yes. Awesome. Well, so I'm excited to learn more. Well, we can, I'll do my best to show you what goes on on a typical day prior to, prior to the spring season. So Sounds great. Come on That's in. Good. Dwayne, thank you for having me out here today. It's, it's great to be here and I'm excited to chat. I'm just wondering if you could start uh, specifically with this location, this room, about just telling me where we are and kind of what this room is used for. Uh, this is our farm shop. We do, I'd say, a fair amount of neighbors or other farmers' equipment that we understand, along with ours. Try to stock appropriate supplies and uh, stay busy that way when we don't take care of our own stuff. Yeah. Can you just tell me a little bit about your farming operation? I know it's kind of been it's, in your family for a while. And... Um, I farm with my brother. Our wives currently work off the farm, but my wife's hinting about retiring this summer. My dad started farming in the early 60s, so we've kind of, my brother and I have kind of grown up with it all along here. Uh, six, seven years ago, we finally got our, our dad bought out, paid off, but he still shows up. Oh, nice. He's 80, he will be 83 years old and still active. So you guys primarily go, uh, grow corn and soybeans? About 1,930 acres of soybeans, 1,900, not quite 2,000 acres of corn. Okay. Um, we no-till all of our soybeans, um, and then uh, one pass in the spring on standing soybean stubble to plant corn. Okay. We are contemplating trying some no-till corn. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about kind of the location of your fields. I know you kind of, it's not just that you, you know, you're, you're located here in Twin Lakes, but you, you're kind of a little bit all over the place we, too. We operate right along the Minnesota-Iowa state line yeah. up to farms near Interstate 90, varying soil types. Um, so being spread out, we spread out the risk as far as what Mother Nature can dish out. What makes growing corn kind of an interesting and unique thing to do? Oh, from what I've seen, the genetics from what I've seen when we started to where they're at now mm -hmm. is amazing. Just truly amazing. What what we can produce on as little moisture last year as we've had. Same with the soybeans. Mm -hmm. We no-till the soybeans. That is made possible by uh, the appropriate weed control. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to no-till soybeans if you were organic, which is extensive tillage, extensive labor. And in today's environment, labor is a challenge also. So as, as you think about your farming career, what's what are the more satisfying kind of parts of it, would you say? Remembering the first bean field that hit 60 bushels an acre. Now we're striving to hold an, an average of 60 or 65 bushel beans in the no-till situation. Or the first time we had, uh, uh, we hit 200 bushel corn, let alone two years ago, we had a, our uh, 1,900 acres or better, we had 208 bushel average across the board. Mm -hmm. the, the technology has done that, is made those levels constantly creeping up. So we're looking at a, a growing season coming up here. We're, we're filming in, in mid-March and planting I'm sure is right around the corner. So it's been a you know an unusually a crazy warm winter. Just can you talk about you know what's what you're thinking as far as planting dates, planting timing, what, what, how's it looking for you out there, I guess? It's 
it's dry. I, 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 yeah, it's, conditions are really nice now. If it was a month from now, we'd be planting. Um, but it's a game of patience right now. I'd love to go out now and see what's going on out in the fields. Maybe you can show me around a little bit. We most certainly can, and I will uh, do my best to give you a quick overview of our conservation practices and stuff, awesome. and then we will uh, maybe go haul some corn. Perfect. Let's do All it. All right? Yeah. All right. What you see in the field here is some uh, subsurface drainage or some tile that was uh, installed last fall. And since then, uh, about a week ago, we went with a disc and or a field cultivator and leveled these lines off so that it's uh, not at nearly as rough for uh, putting the pre-emerge herbicide down and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the soil conditions um, for, for March, mm -hmm. it, it, it just, more or less flows through your hands. Um, basically, it's an indication we need some moisture. Mm -hmm. This time of year, typically that soil is sticky, sure. kind of sticks together. Um, yeah. We need some moisture. This has had hog manure applied. Okay. Um, minimal soil impact last fall. Um, it will be supplying probably about two thirds of our nitrogen needs okay. through the, we, got an analysis of the hog manure, apply it at a, the appropriate rate, foolish to put on more than you need for realistic yields. So you talk about nitrogen, and it's one of those, one of those kind of building blocks for your crop, right? That is correct, yes. Yeah, so tell me, you, without nitrogen, could you, could you get a corn crop around here? Boy, it, it'd be going back into the 40s and the 50s for yield results if we don't apply the appropriate amount of fertilizer. We drink the same water everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And we have made tremendous strides in the last 15 to 20 years of taking these things into consideration. Not that it wasn't before, but if we, if we don't take care of what produces the crop for us, we're gonna go backwards. And that's not in our nature to go backwards. Are there other nutrients that you apply to fields besides nitrogen? Uh, phosphorus, potassium. Um, in our starter fertilizer, we are adding some zinc. What we have now after 30 to 40 years of minimum tillage or no fall primary tillage, we have potting soil. We don't have dirt. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Well, maybe let's go and see some of those those practices, does that sound okay. good? Let's do yes. it. Yeah. All right. Basically what I'm, gonna, I'm trying to show here is a, more of a conservation uh, practices. We'll be, mm -hmm. no, we'll be no tilling soybeans into the corn stalks here. Uh, we're on probably some of our uh, more hilly, more extreme properties, but uh, um, in the towards the west southwest there, there's a stream that runs through this piece of property. We have there are filter strips on both sides. So your conservation practice, I mean, are these practices you've been implementing for a long time? Some of our fields, uh, the standing corn stock, we've been no-tilling the. 18 to 1900 acres for the past, all of them for the past uh, 17 to 18 years. Yeah. We have some farms that have, we've been no-tilling soybeans for almost 40. So um, yeah, the no-till soybean practices have been going on for, yes, quite a while. We quit using anhydrous ammonia six or seven years ago when we ended up uh, applying or acquiring more hog barns. And in terms of no-till, is it just you get better soil structure, you less compaction? Both. All of the above? Both. You, you hit the nail on the head. And so. less erosion? Less erosion. Yeah. Since we've done the no-till practices, huh? 
our um, soil runoff has diminished greatly. Subsoil drainage is extremely important. What it does is it creates an active filter. Yeah. So if you can have the water go through the soil structure versus off the top, when it discharges into the stream, the, the water quality is as good or better than what's in the stream. Huh. So Duane, tell me just where, where we're standing about where we are here. Oh, this is a, a grain facility. Uh, I mean, currently we have about 25% um, uh, of the storage has corn in it now. Uh, so around 75,000 bushels of corn left to sell. Um, not sure when we're gonna price it. Uh, market will indicate that. The facility holds around 310 to 325,000. We're ballpark around 75,000 bushels left of corn here. Throughout the year, you're selling the corn you harvested from the previous year. That is correct, yes. Yeah. Um, most of the time, uh, I say most of the time, most of the time the corn is all sold or the facility is empty by the second or third week in June. Okay. Soybeans are typically gone February, first part of March. Where is this corn you've, you've got here going today? It's going to a poet ethanol plant. Okay. So um, the most all of our corn goes to a poet ethanol plant. Our soybeans go to um, CHS in Fairmont, Minnesota. We're in the cleanup process right now. So um, once we fire things up here, uh, I'll be entering the bin and we'll load a truckload of corn and proceed to the poet. Well, that's it for this episode of Nate on the Farm. Thanks for joining me as I toured Dwayne's farm. It was great to be here and I'm so glad you could join me. And tune in next time to learn more about the growing season and what it takes to raise a crop here in Minnesota. We'll see you again soon.